Good morning. My name is Jim Carmichael. I'm the prison minister for the Park uh, Prison Ministry, which is a, uh, a mission field with associated with the Park Church of Christ in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And the purpose of my uh, of this video is to introduce a young man by the name of Andrew Williams. Andrew's been in prison most of his life. Uh, I believe he's 38 years old. Uh, just had his birthday. I believe he's 38. Uh, dealing mostly with drugs and, and that sort of thing. And a member of a gang. I think it was just... Um, a couple of years ago, about three years ago probably, that Andrew decided to turn his life over to God and to quit the gang. So he had asked for prayers from the church, which we responded in great numbers. Uh, but he asked for uh, prayers from the church for his protection because he said it's not a matter of if he would be killed for leaving the gang, but a matter of when. And so it turns out... Um, they didn't kill him. He, he's okay. And he, he moved over to the, uh, uh, a different unit that, has, that deals with faith and, and that sort of thing. He also became a uh, chapel orderly. And um, he's one of those men that we sponsored for a higher education in Christian studies. And he's actually gained quite a bit of education in in the uh, Christian studies. And I, when you receive the packet that I'm going to share, send this video with, you'll see all of his accomplishments. So um, he gave his life to Christ, became one of the orderlies, and uh, he has been growing at, in leaps and bounds since that time. He now is not only a devoted Christian, a student, but he's also a teacher. He teaches leadership uh, classes at the prison for prisoners. He's also evangelizing. Um, he's, act, he's just a great prison evangelist, actually. And he's not only evangelizing the prisoners, but the, um, the officers as well. It's kind of a phenomenal thing to see. Um, for the most part, for the last two years, he's also been what I call our inside man for new life behavior. He's been uh, teaching these classes, handing out the courses, grading the courses for the men on the inside. When, so all we had left to do was create the certificates for those who had um, completed the courses. I guess I would say that if anyone has ever gone through a 180 degree change, it must be Andrew Williams. So this, the rest of this video is going to be Andrew. Now, I've, I've just included different clips from um, different things, so it might seem a little choppy at times, but uh, we went in, uh, Kevin Williams, uh, Kevin Williams, I'm sorry, uh, Kevin Peters went into the prison with me uh, a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, something like that. And we made videos, uh, interviewed the guys. Uh, we did the sermon in which um, Andrew was part of that. So you'll see him in this video uh, giving his part of the sermon that night. And I can tell you since that time, his growth in that area, his ability to preach is phenomenal. He's, he's literally becoming a great preacher, and he's known as that on the inside as well. Hopefully it would help him with his pro. Uh, that, that should be next year sometime, we hope. And um, I can't even imagine how much more he'll grow in that next year, but he'll certainly um, is ready to reenter society in a healthy, uh, way being a very productive citizen, but not just a productive citizen, but a, a, a Christian leader. So, uh, with all that said, let's go ahead and get into the video uh, about Andrew. So, thank you for your time, and I um, 
I hope you have very positive feelings for Andrew when this is all said and done. Thank you. Um, my name is Justin Moss. Uh, it's because of brother Andrew. I worked in the chow hall or in the kitchen and every morning that he came through breakfast time, uh, he would drop his tray off in my area that I worked in and he would tell me, God bless you and Jesus loves you every morning faithfully. Uh, and it, and it impacted me because everybody needs to hear that. Everybody. Uh, and it was kind of confirmation. Uh, but after so long of doing that, it eventually pulled at my heart. And it got me back into reading my Bible, but I still wasn't coming down here. Uh, because I was still, I was still messing with things of the world. And eventually, I just cried out to him one morning when he told him, I'm going to be down there tonight. And he told me, praise God, and I'll be waiting on you. And sure enough, he was waiting on me down the hill here with open arms. And it was thanks to him and Reggie that, uh, that led me to where I'm at now. Andrew. You tried. Okay, so I, um, I'm going to try to do this without preaching, and I don't like this, I'm sorry. So anyway, y'all don't, don't need a mic, y'all can hear me. So this story is about a German soldier. But before I start this story, I want to um, read a scripture, because you said we was all you know, meant to go out and be missionaries or meant to, you know, spread the gospel or whatever the case may be, as long as it's for God, right? So I was sitting over there and, it, and, and I felt like God told me to read out of Luke 4, 18. And it says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. It's up on each and every one of y'all that believe in God. And it says, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel. It's not just our family, that's to everybody. It goes on further. It says, to, to the poor, it says, He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives and recover of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Guys, this is the time right now. I, I can tell you right now that God can change your life and you're going to see it by this story. He, there's things that he's taken out of my life that I can never give up on my own. And there's still some things in my life that I need to give up, just like each and every one of y'all. So the story tonight is about a German soldier. Now, I want you to imagine being a soldier because you go through some things. So it was 1945, and World War II had come to a close. That means he's seen the beginning to the end. And it says, a young man sat broken inside of a POW camp. He had been a reluctant soldier in Hitler's army. And here inside a prison in Scotland, he had months to contemplate what had been and what was to come. Not just what had been, but what is to come. Like each and every one of us should be looking in our lives, what is to come. So it goes on further. And it says, this is, this is really what, what caught me when I read this. This is exactly what he writes word for word. And it says, September 1945 in Camp 22 in Scotland, we were confronted with pictures of Belson and Auschwitz. Slowly and relentlessly, the truth filtered into our awareness. And we saw ourselves mirrored in the, in, in, in the eyes of the Nazi victims. That had to be a sight, right? He was Hitler's soldier. Mm goes on further, and it says, this is what he come to. He says, was this what we had fought for? Had our past generation at last been driven to death so that the concentration camp murders could go on killing and Hitler could live a couple months longer? 
It says that he's seen this and it caused depression from the wartime destruction and from captivity that looked like it had no end. You know, I've done a lot of time and sometimes I know how that can feel. When you're doing a sentence that it looks like you're adding days instead of taking it. I'm sure this man was in that position. He said it strangled and choked us. It was a stronghold that was just choking the life out of him. Maybe you're in prison right now or maybe you'll be watching this on, on, online or whatever the case may be. But you don't have to be in, in here just to be in prison. You can be a prisoner of your own self. Be in prison of your mind, of, of oppression, whatever it may be. Depression for this man. You know, it says that a chaplain uh, gave him a Bible. He had nothing else to do with his time. What are you doing with your time? It says he had nothing else to do, so he started reading it. He came to Psalms. And this is what he said. He, he, he puts it as he heard resounding voices of agony from people who felt God had abandoned them. He said felt. We don't always go by our feelings, right? We go by the spirit, right? Because if you go by what you feel, you'll be led astray. I went and did that all my life. But I want to finish because he said it wasn't until the story of Christ crucified that he encountered a God who had experienced suffering, abandonment, and pain. You know, I look at what Jesus said on the cross, Eli, Eli, lama shabbatani. And what he's saying is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, he forsook him so he didn't have to forsake you. It's your choice. But the story doesn't end here. You know, he had permission to go to a, while being, and this was in 1947, he finally got permission to go to a Christian conference. And there were some J Dutch Christians, some, some young uh, Christians, but what they did is um, they wanted to uh, interview somebody that was in POW. He ended up being one of the young men that they interviewed. And you would figure the way that, that, that they talked to him was out of vindictiveness or out of pain and suffering or maybe even out of anger for what he'd done. That's not what happened. This man went to this conference and it was the love that they showed him. They asked this man for forgiveness. It was completely unexpected. And I imagine it was. But to have that, it says that the, the Christians embodied him with the love of God. Something that the German probably didn't have for a while. But he goes on to pin this. And, and, and actually, I, I don't want to start with that. Because the soldier, you would figure... Where he was at, that would be the end of his life, right? His name was Jurgen Moltmann. And by the love that the Christian showed, he ended up being one of the greatest theologians of the 20th century. Imagine what you could be. But this is what he penned. He says this right here. The ultimate reason for our hope is not to be found in what we want, wish for, or wait for. He said the ultimate reason is that we are waited or wanted, wished for, and waited for. It is whenever we base our hope and trust in the divine mystery that we can feel deep down in our hearts that someone is waiting for us, but not just waiting for us, someone that believes in us. You know, it's hard to believe in somebody if they're just a regular human being, right? Right? Because you'll fail. Your relationships will fall. But not with the relationship with God. It don't fall. You might fall, but he'll lift you up. So, I want, I want to finish with this because... Uh, 
You know, I, I, hate, I hate to say it like this, man, but it, it's true. We are, I mean, God is our last hope because we are his first love, right? To recap on this, I want you to understand that this prisoner did not die in prison. He actually went from wartime to a prison cell, but he eventually ended up behind a pulpit. That is a drastic change. So, so what I ask right now is what change are you willing to make in your life and, and will it be for God? Because that's what this man did. No matter how much pain, sitting in your cell and being alone in a POW camp, I mean, it's not as bad as eating in the chow hall. I mean, I mean it's worse than that. You know what I'm saying? Like, so I, so I ask tonight to really rethink about what you're living like and, and who you're living it for. Because two years ago, I wouldn't be up here. Two years ago, I wouldn't even be standing and reading in front of anybody more or less singing on stage with my brothers. I don't really care what, what the yard thinks because I know what God thinks. He knows, hey, man, you're going to fall. You're going to stumble, but I'm going to lift you back up. He lifted this man up, the greatest theologian, one of them of the 20th century. And I could just imagine what he can do in y'all's life. So with that, I'm, I'm going to give it back over to Jim. And I love y'all, man. And I appreciate y'all coming. You know, you say something, Fox, about the other day when we was having that prayer. And, you know, we did fight battle that day. We're continuing to fight today. Um, I want to read, you know, it says, Enter into his courts or enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise and be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures forever. Amen. You know, I look at that, man, and, and what we did the other day, man, I believe it did more than just open doors. I believe it put an opportunity because I've seen just like you have, I've seen people come in here and as soon as they come in here, we had, a, we had a gentleman the other day that as soon as he came in one of our small groups, it was like the spirit hit him, but he didn't know how to deal with it. And what I really want to ask right now is I want to ask, you know, a couple brothers in here um, because what happens when we run into those situations where people don't really know what to do because like this gentleman, he took the message and thought everybody was trying to just, you know, pin things at him and shoot ammo at him or, you know, arrows or whatever. But what I want to ask um, you, Reggie, is what do we do in those positions when those people come down here that are uncomfortable, but yet we still show the love of God? Like what else could we possibly do? You know, Reggie, I got a question for you too, because, you know, being down here sometimes it's hard to get actually to where we can mingle with the yard and actually invite people in. But, you know, you said some, something else will go about grace and mercy, and it's hard to give something that you don't have. It's impossible. You can't give love if I haven't received it from God. So therefore, it would just be phileo love. It would just be that brotherly love, that kindness. But I know each and every one of y'all, I've seen your hearts. I've seen what the Spirit is doing in your life. So I really need to, to ask you, what do you think that we could do to basically be able to bring more people in because, like I said, man, it's hard for us to go out there being separate. Like, what do you have some ideas? Man, uh... So my name is Andrew Williams, and um, I got introduced to the Park Prison Ministry through apologetics. Um, you know, it's a course that we've taken, and it's basically based on history, but it, it also gives you artifacts to where you can prove that the Bible is true. So that's kind of how I got involved into the church, and then it just went from there. So when I came to prison, I made a, a deal with myself that I would, you know, take the things that was not no good in my life and, and change them for good. This is my third time being in, so um, more on a spiritual level, I have been changed, you know, from my heart, and uh, I've had more compassion. I've been more compassionate. I'm not in, you know, the gang life that I used to be in. Um, but he's, he's really opened a door for me and an opportunity. It's something that I've never really had. So to have an opportunity to, to be part of something, you know, to be blessed, um, 
needless to say, is uh, it's a blessing for me and my family as well, too, because, I mean, I really wasn't raised, you know, just kind of like in a godly household. So it's, it's really been a it's been a journey. So I started out by going and getting my GED. Um, they told me that you have to do that before you could apply for college. But while I was waiting on getting my GED, I took the Foundation for Biblical Institute from this chapel, and I got my bachelor's degree from there. Um, I got my ordination and my doctor degree from Universal Life Church, and then I went and got my GED and enrolled in Tulsa Community College, and now I'm enrolled in Cypress in Bible College. I was kind of hoping that I could go out there and, and, and speak to kids that have had the same kind of life that I lived. You know, living in a household where you really didn't feel like you could actually love or care about anybody. But now that I have that knowledge, I really feel like I need to share that. Because a lot of times, like, kids are raised up in households where, you know, their parents might be busy. They might not always be there. And I can actually, I can feel that. Like, I've been there. So that's kind of what I want to do is just use my ministry and use what God has given me to go out and make the better um, I met Jim Carmichael and his wife Jody and Jim Pinkston. So, you know, when they gave me an opportunity um, here a while back, they gave us an opportunity to preach and kind of pick up some slack here on the yard, um, as well as new life behavior. And it's been a blessing in my life because not really having family, it gave me something to feel like I'm, I'm accepted. And, and it was the love of God that was really shown by that whole church. You know, there's people that come in and sing and, and stuff like that. And it's like everybody that I run into from that church, I mean, it just, they got the love of God. And that's something that I've never experienced in my life. Um, I would like to start off by saying, like, the new life behavior that the uh, Prison Park Church brings to here has lifted people up. And um, to have somebody that is willing to pour into you when you really haven't poured into anybody else, that's a big step for here because a lot of people that are here, they feel like they don't have nothing going for them. But through the apologetics, through the new life behavior that the church is funding, people's lives are being changed. And that's the number one thing that we want to shoot for here. Being a chapel worker, going day in and day out, grading papers and whatnot, that, that may seem like a burden at times. But I have to look at the blessing side of it. People come down here and pour their lives out to us. And if it wasn't for the churches coming in and funding this, then these lives would not be changed. So, you know, starting out, um, I would see people come down here because, you know, three or four years ago, I just started coming down here. And um, I wouldn't see much of a change on the yard. But here recently, after the courses and, and everything else that has been going on, people have actually been going back and starting Bible studies. They're doing prayer call. Um, they're basically going and helping people that, that don't have no help. So to be down here and have first eye of that is, is a blessing. Um, I've seen people that, that have just got here and, and got saved. I've also seen people on the yard that have never went to church, really, and recently got saved, and now they're trying to give their testimony. They're trying to become part of the church. And that comes to the acceptance and the love that y'all show. I have uh, something to say because, you know, both of y'all mentioned uh, hope. And, um, you know, living on, when I was on the street, like, you know, I'm not going back or anything, but, uh, you know, I never really had a hope at all. Um, my hope was in what I could grasp, what I could hold on to, what could replace the pain that was in my life. You know, I have a sister out there, man, that means the world to me. But <clears throat> I'll read Jeremiah 29, 11. It says, For I know the thoughts that I have towards you, or think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. You know, I look at it when I came to the county, and, and you know, the Lord finally got me to where he needed me to be. Um, you know, we got a message that's coming up and, you know, it's it's in your despair, your deepest, darkest times that God will show up. And um, that's what he did. But I want to actually thank each and every one of y'all that are at this table, too, especially the ones that have been here for a long time. Because when I got here, I was still a little bit shaken up about who I could trust, who is on my side, because my whole life seemed like failure. But God put a future in front of me and he put a hope in, in front of me. And, and trying to grasp that sometimes can seem hard. It can seem like it's just unreachable. 
but Reggie and, and Rico and you, Fox, and the same thing with you, Perry. You know, we've been over here. I'm, I've been going on five years with y'all. And um, same every, we rode together. every time that I was down and been down, I've been able to run y'all and just tell y'all, man, hey, I love y'all because I see y'all as family. And that's what we are. So I want to ask something real quick. I want to ask, what does the hope that God gave you, what does it look like? What's it look like in your life? 